Section twenty of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter nineteen: The Descent, the Chamber of Penitence. Having bound Flora Francatelli to the chair in the manner just described, the three nuns fell back a few paces, and the wretched girl felt the floor giving way under her. A dreadful scream burst from her lips as slowly, slowly the chair sank down while the working of hidden machinery in the roof and the steady monotonous revolution of wheels sounded with ominous din upon her ears an icy stream appeared to pour over her soul wildly she cast around her eyes and then more piercing became her shrieks as she found herself gradually descending into what seemed to be a pit or well only that it was square instead of round the ropes creaked the machinery continued its regular movement and the lamp fixed in the skylight overhead became less and less brilliant and bending over the mouth of this pit into which she was descending were the three nuns standing motionless and silent like hideous spectres on the brink of the aperture left by the square platform or trap whereon the chair was fixed mercy mercy exclaimed flora in a voice expressive of the most acute anguish and stretching forth her snowy arms for it was round the waist and by the feet that she was fastened to the chair she convulsively placed her open palms against the wooden walls of the pit as if she could by that spasmodic movement arrest the descent of the terrible apparatus that was bearing her down into that hideous unknown gulf but the walls were smooth and even and presented nothing whereon she could fix her grasp her brain reeled and for a few minutes she sat motionless in dumb inert despair then again in obedience to some mechanical impulse she glanced upward the light of the lamp was now dimly seen like the sun through a dense mist but the dark figures were still bending over the brink of the abyss thirty yards above the descent was still progressing and the noise of the machinery still reached her ears with buzzing humming monotonous indistinctness she shrieked not now she screamed not any more but it was not resignation that sealed her lips it was despair suddenly she became aware of the gradual disappearance of the three nuns as she descended the walls seemed to rise slowly upward and cover them from her view then for an instant there was a slight shock given to the platform whereon the chair was placed as if it rested on something beneath but no the fearful descent still went on for when she stretched forth her hand to touch the walls they appeared to be slowly rising rising she was now involved in almost total darkness but far far overhead the dim lustre of the lamp was seen and the four walls of the gulf now appeared to touch the ceiling of the room above and to enclose that faint but still distinct orb within the narrow space thus shut in the noise of the machinery also reached her still but merely with a humming sound that was only just audible for an instant she doubted whether she were still descending but alas when her arms were a third time convulsively stretched forth her fair hands felt the wall slipping away from her touch gliding upward as it were with steady emotion then she knew that the descent had not ceased but whither was she going to what awful depth was she progressing already she conjectured was she at least sixty yards beneath that dim yellow orb which every instant appeared to shine as through a deeper deepening mist for what fate was she reserved and where was she suddenly it struck her that she was an inmate of the carmelite convent for the rumours alluded to in a preceding chapter had often met her ears and her imagination naturally associated them with the occurrences of that dreadful night the piercing shrieks the noise of machinery the disappearance from time to time of some member of that monastic institution all the incidents in fine to which those rumours had ever pointed now seemed to apply to her own case these reflections flashed with lightning rapidity through her brain and paralysed her with horror then she lost all further power of thought and though not absolutely fainting she was stunned and stupefied with the tremendous weight of overwhelming despair how long she remained in this condition she knew not but she was suddenly aroused by the opening of a low door in the wall in front of her starting as from a dreadful dream she stretched forth her arms and became aware that the descent had stopped and at the same moment she beheld a nun bearing a lamp standing on the threshold of the door which had just opened sister 
welcome to the chamber of penitence said the recluse approaching the terrified flora then placing the lamp in a niche near the door the nun proceeded to remove the cords which fashioned the young maiden to the chair flora rose but fell back again on the seat for her limbs were stiff in consequence of the length of time they had been retained in one position the nun disappeared by the little door for a few minutes and on her return presented the wretched girl a cup of cold water flora swallowed the icy beverage and felt refreshed then by the light of the lamp in the niche she hastily examined the countenance of the nun but its expression was cold repulsive stern and flora knew that it was useless to seek to make a friend of her a frightful sense of loneliness as it were struck her like an ice shaft penetrating to her very soul and clasping her hands together she exclaimed holy virgin protect me no harm will befall you daughter said the nun if you manifest contrition for past errors and a resolution to devote your future years to the service of heaven my past errors repeated flora with mingled indignation and astonishment i am not aware that i ever injured a living soul by a word or deed nor entertained a thought for which i needed to blush neither have i neglected those duties which manifest the gratitude of mortals for the bounties bestowed upon them by providence ah daughter exclaimed the nun you interpret not your own heart rightly have you never abandoned yourself to those carnal notions those hopes those fears those dreams of happiness which constitute the passion which the world calls love flora started and a blush mantled on her cheeks before so pale you see that i have touched a chord which vibrates to your heart's core daughter continued the nun on whom that sudden evidence of emotion was not lost you have suffered yourself to be deluded by the whisperings of that feeling whose tendency was to wean your soul from heaven and is it possible that a pure and virtuous love can be construed into a crime demanded the young maiden her indignation overpowering her fears a love that is founded on and fostered by ambition is a sin replied the nun marriage is doubtless an institution ordained by heaven but it becomes a curse and is repulsive to all pious feelings when it unites those whose passion is made up of sensuality and selfishness you dare not impute such base considerations to me exclaimed flora her cheeks again flushing but with a glow of conscious innocence shamefully outraged by the most injurious suspicions nay daughter continued the nun unmoved by the manner of the young maiden you are unable to judge rightly of your own heart you possess a confidence in integrity of purpose which is but a mental blindness on your part of what am i accused and wherefore am i brought hither asked flora beginning to feel bewildered by the sophistry that characterized the nun's discourse those who are interested in your welfare replied the nun evasively have consigned you to the care of persons devoted to the service of heaven that your eyes may be opened to the vanity of the path which you have been pursuing but from which you are so happily rescued and where am i is this the covent of the carmelites why was i subjected to all the alarms all the mental tortures through which i have just passed demanded the young maiden wildly and rapidly think not that we have acted towards you in a spirit of persecution said the nun the mysteries which have alarmed you will be explained at a future period when your soul is prepared by penance self-mortification and prayer to receive the necessary revelation in the meantime ask no questions forget the world and resolve to embrace a life devoted to the service of heaven to embrace a conventual existence almost shrieked the wretched girl oh no never not many days will elapse ere your mind will undergo a salutary chain said the nun composedly but if you will follow me as you appear to be somewhat recovered i will conduct you to your cell adjoining the chamber of penitence flora perceiving that any further attempt to reason with the recluse would be fruitlessly made rose and followed her into a narrow dark passage at the end of which was a door standing half open the nun extinguished her lamp and led the way into a large apartment hung with black at the further end there was an altar surmounted by a crucifix of ebony and lighted up with four wax candles which only served to render the gloom of the entire scene more apparent at the foot of the altar knelt five women half naked and holding scourges in their hands these are the penitents whispered the nun to flora pause for a moment and contemplate them 
a minute elapsed during which the five penitents remained motionless as statues with their heads bowed upon their bosoms and their hands hanging down by their sides as if those limbs were lifeless save in respect to the hands that held the scourges but suddenly one of them a young and beautiful woman exclaimed in a tone of piercing anguish it is my fault it is my fault it is my fault and the others took up the wail in voices equally characteristic of heartfelt woe then they lacerated their shoulders with the hard leathern thongs of their scourges and a faintness came over flora francatelli when she observed the blood appear on the back of the young and beautiful penitent who had given the signal for this self-mortification the nun perceiving the effect thus produced upon the maiden touched her upon the shoulder as a signal to follow whither she was about to lead and opening one of the several doors communicating with the chamber of penitence she said in a low whisper this is your cell may the virgin bless you flora entered the little room allotted to her and the nun retired simply closing but not bolting the door behind her a taper burnt before a crucifix suspended to the wall and near it hung the scourge from which last mentioned object flora averted her eyes with horror a bed a simple toilet table a praying desk and a single chair completed the furniture of the cell which was of very narrow dimensions seating herself on the bed flora burst into an agony of tears what would her aunt think when she received the news of her disappearance for she could not suppose that any friendly feeling on the part of her persecutors would induce them to adopt a course which might relieve that much-loved relative's mind concerning her what would francisco conjecture oh these thoughts were maddening anxious to escape from them if possible the almost heartbroken girl proceeded to lay aside her garments and retire to rest physical and mental exhaustion cast her into a deep sleep but the horrors of her condition pursued her even in her dreams so that when she awoke she was not startled to find herself in that gloomy cell casting her eyes around she observed two circumstances which showed her that some one had visited her room during the hour she slept for a new taper was burning before the crucifix and her own garments had been removed the coarse garb of a penitent now occupying their place on the chair oh is it possible that i am doomed to bid farewell to the world for ever exclaimed flora in a voice of despair as she clasped her hands convulsively together End of section twenty. section twenty one of wagner the werewolf by george w m reynolds this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 Francisco and Nisida Dr. Duras and the Letter The greatest confusion prevailed in the Riverola Palace when, in the morning, the disappearance of Flora Francatelli was discovered. Nisida hastened, at an early hour, to her brother's apartment and intimated to him the fact that she was nowhere to be found francisco who was already dressed was overwhelmed with grief at this announcement and in the first excess of excitement conveyed to her his intention of seeking the young maiden throughout the city he was hastening to quit the room when nisida held him back and intimated to him that his anxiety in this respect would create suspicions injurious alike to his reputation and that of flora francatelli more so as she was but a menial in the household Francisco paused and reflected for a few moments, then, having tenderly embraced his sister, he hastily addressed her by the symbolic language in which they were accustomed to converse. Pardon me, beloved Nisida, for having kept a secret from thee, the only one that my heart has ever so selfishly cherished. Nisida appeared to be profoundly astonished at this communication, and made an impatient sign for him to proceed you will not be surprised at my anxiety to seek after the missing girl he continued when i intimate to you that i love her and that next to yourself she is dearer to me than i can express your passion can scarcely be an honourable one francisco was the reproach conveyed by nisida while her countenance wore a corresponding expression i would sooner die than harbour an injurious thought in respect to that virtuous and beautiful creature responded the young count his face flushed with the glow of generous emotions my happiness is intimately connected with this attachment nisida and i feel convinced that you would rather forward my views than oppose them yes dear brother was the reply which she conveyed to him 
your happiness is my only consideration but as she gave this assurance an ill-subdued sigh escaped her breast and she compressed her lips tightly to compress the emotions that were agitating her a cloud effervescently appeared on the broad and marble forehead the pencilled brows contracted and the eyes flashed brightly oh far more brightly than glanced the ray of the morning sun through the windows upon the glossy surface of her luxuriant hair a momentary spasm seemed to convulse the full and rounded form and the small elegantly shaped foot which peered from beneath her flowing robe tapped the floor twice with involuntary movement mistress as she usually was of even her most intense feelings and wonderfully habituated by circumstances to exercise the most complete command over her emotions she was now for an instant vanquished by the gush of painful sentiments which crowded on her soul francisco did not however observe that transitory evidence of acute feeling on the part of his sister a feeling which seemed to partake of the nature of remorse as if she were conscience-stricken for she loved her brother deeply tenderly but after the fashion of her own wild and wonderful disposition a love that was not calculated always to prove friendly to his interests francisco paced the room in an agitated manner at length he stopped near where his sister was standing and intimated to her that flora might perhaps have repaired to the residence of her aunt nisida conveyed to him this answer the moment that i miss flora ere now i dispatched a domestic to her aunt's cottage but she has not been there since sunday last some treachery is at work here nisida was the young count's response flora has not willingly absented herself at this moment francisco's page entered the apartment to announce that dr duras was in the reception room the young count made a sign to his sister to accompany him and they proceeded to the elegant saloon where the physician was waiting having saluted the count and nisida with his usual urbanity dr duras addressed himself to the former saying i have just learnt from your lordship's page that the favourite attendant on your sister has most unaccountably disappeared and both nisida and myself are at a loss to what to conjecture or how to act replied francisco florence is at this moment the scene of dreadful crimes observed the physician yesterday morning a young female was murdered by a near neighbour of mine i was astounded when i heard of the arrest of signor wagner on such a charge interrupted the count he was latterly a frequent guest at this house although i believe you never happened to meet him here no answered the physician but i saw him at the funeral of your lamented father and once or twice since in the garden attached to his mansion and i certainly could not have supposed from his appearance that he was a man capable of so black a crime i was however about to observe that florence is at this moment infested by a class of villains who hesitate at no deed of turpitude this signor wagner is a foreigner possessed of immense wealth the sources of which are totally unknown and moreover it is declared that the sbirri yesterday morning actually traced the robber captain stefano to the vicinity of his mansion all this looks black enough and it is more than probable that wagner was in league with the redoubtable stefano and his banditti then the mysterious disappearance of flora is to say the least alarming for i believe she was a well-conducted virtuous estimable young woman she was she was indeed exclaimed francisco at least he added perceiving that the physician was somewhat astonished at the enthusiasm with which he spoke at least such is my firm impression such too is the opinion of my sister the motive which brought me hither this morning said dr duras was to offer you a little friendly advice which my long acquaintance with your family my dear count will prevent you from taking amiss speak doctor speak your thoughts cried francisco pressing the physician's hand gratefully i would recommend you to be more cautious how you form an intimacy with strangers continued dr duras rumour has a thousand tongues and it is already reported in florence that the alleged murderer was on friendly terms with the noble count of riverola and lady nisida the duke himself is liable to be deceived in respect to the real character of an individual said francisco proudly but his highness would not form hasty acquaintances replied the physician after all it is with the best possible feeling that i offer you my counsel knowing your generous heart and also how frequently generosity is imposed upon 
pardon the impatience with which i answered you my dear friend exclaimed the young count no pardon is necessary said the physician because you did not offend me one word more and i must take my leave crimes are multiplying thickly in florence and stefano's band becomes every day more and more daring so that it is unsafe to walk alone in the city after dusk beware how you stir and attended my dear francisco at unseasonable hours my habits are not of that nature replied the count i will however thank you cordially for your well-meant advice but you appear to connect the disappearance of flora Franticali, he added very seriously with the dreadful deeds supposed to be committed by signor wagner i merely conjecture that this wagner is associated with that lawless horde who have become the terror of the republic answered the physician and it is natural to suppose that these wretches are guilty of all the enormous crimes which have lately struck the city with alarm francisco turned aside to conceal the emotions which these remarks excited within him for he began to comprehend that she whom he loved so fondly had met with foul play at the hands of the bravos and banditti whom stefano was known to command dr duras seized that opportunity to reproach nisida who was standing at the window and as he thrust into her hand a note which was immediately concealed in her dress he was struck with surprise and grief at the acute anguish that was depicted on her countenance large tears stood on her long dark lashes and her face was ashy pale the physician made a sign of anxious inquiry but nisida subduing her emotion with an almost superhuman effort pressed his hand violently and hurried from the room dr duras shook his head mournfully but also in a manner which showed that he was at a loss to comprehend that painful manifestation of feeling on the part of one whom he well knew to be endowed with almost miraculous powers of self-control his meditations were interrupted by francisco who addressing him abruptly said in respect to the missing young lady whose absence will be so acutely felt by my sister the only course which i can at present pursue is to communicate her mysterious disappearance to the captain of police no time should be lost in adopting that step responded the doctor i am about to visit a sick nobleman in the neighbourhood of the captain's office we will proceed so far in each other's company the young count summoned his page to attend upon him and then quitted the mansion in company with the physician in the meantime nisida had retired to her own apartment where she threw herself into a seat and gave vent to the dreadful emotions which had for the last hour been agitated within her bosom she wept oh she wept long and bitterly it was terrible and strange to think how that woman of iron mind now yielded to the outpourings of her anguish some time elapsed ere she even attempted to control her feelings and then her attempt to subdue them was as sudden and energetic as her grief had a moment previously been violent and apparently inconsolable then she recollected the note which dr duras had slipped into her hand and which she had concealed in her bosom and she hastened to peruse it the contents ran as follows in accordance with your request my noble-hearted and much enduring friend i have consulted eminent lawyers in respect to the will of the late count riverola the substance of their opinion is unanimously this the estates are inalienably settled on yourself should you recover the faculties of hearing and speaking at any time previous to your brother's attainment of the age of thirty and should you enter into possession of the estates and allow your brother to enjoy the whole or greater part of the revenues in direct contradiction to the spirit of your father's will the estates would become liable to confiscation by his highness the duke in this case your brother and yourself would alike be ruined now the advice that these lawyers give is this a memorial should be addressed to his highness exhibiting that you refuse to undergo any surgical treatment or operation for the restoration of the faculties of hearing and speech insomuch as you would not wish to deprive your brother of the enjoyment of the estates nor of the title conferred by their possession that you therefore solicit a decree confirming his title of nobility and dispensing with the prerogative of confiscation on the part of the prince should you recover the faculties of hearing and speech and act in opposition to the will of your late father in respect to the power of alienating the estates from your own possession such my generous-minded friend is the counsel offered by eminent advocates and by the memory of your sainted mother if not for the sake of your own happiness i implore you to act in accordance with these suggestions 
you will remember that this advice pretty accurately corresponds with that which i gave you when late on the night that the will was read you quitted your sleepless couch and came to my dwelling to consult me on a point so intimately connected with your felicity in this world your sincerely devoted friend geronimo duras while nista was occupied in the perusal of the first paragraph of this letter dark clouds lowered upon her brow and as she read the second paragraph wherein the salutary advice of the lawyers was conveyed to her those clouds rapidly disappeared and her splendid countenance became lighted up with joyous burning intoxicating hope it was evident that she had already made up her mind to adopt the counsel proffered her by the eminent advocates whom the friendly physician had consulted on her behalf End of section twenty one Section twenty two of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty one The Suburb of Alla Croce, the Jew, the Robber Chief's Love. It was past the hour of ten on Saturday night when a tall, powerfully built man emerged from what might be termed the fashionable portion of the city of Florence and struck into the straggling suburb of Alla Croce this quarter of the town was of marvellously bad reputation being infested with persons of the worst description who by herding as it were together in one particular district had converted the entire suburb into a sort of sanctuary where crime might take refuge and into which the sbirri or police officers scarcely dared to penetrate the population of alla croce was not however entirely composed of individuals who were at variance with the law the poverty as well as crime sought an asylum in that assemblage of forbidding-looking dwellings which formed so remarkable a contrast with the marble palaces noble public buildings and handsome streets of the city of florence itself and not only did the denizens of penury and crushing toil the artisans the vine-dressers the gardeners the water-carriers and the porters of florence occupy lodgings in the suburb of alla croce but even wealthy persons yes men whose treasures were vast enough to pay the ransom of princes buried themselves and their hordes in this horrible neighbourhood we allude to that most undeservably persecuted race the jews a race endowed with many virtues and generous qualities but whose characters have been blackened by a host of writers whose narrow minds and illiberal prejudices have induced them to preserve all the exaggerations and misrepresentations which tradition hands down in the christian world relative to the cruelly treated israelite the enlightened commercial policy of those merchant princes the medici had during the primal glories of their administrative sway in the florentine republic relaxed the severity of laws against the jews and recognizing in the persecuted israelites those grand trading and financial qualities which have ever associated the idea of wealth with their name permitted them to follow unmolested their specific pursuits but at the time of which we are writing the year fifteen twenty one the prince who had the reins of the florentine government had yielded to the representations of a bigoted and intolerant clergy and the jews had once more become the subjects of persecution the dissipated nobles extorted from them by menace those loans which would not have been granted on the security proffered and the wealthy members of the scattered race actually began to discover that they could repose greater confidence in the recluse of the florentine population than in the brilliant aristocracy or even in the famous sbirri themselves thus had many rich jews established themselves in the quarter of alla croce and by paying a certain sum to the syndic or magistrate of this suburb a functionary elected by the inhabitants themselves and in virtue of a law of their own enactment the persecuted israelites enjoyed comparative security and peace we now return to the man we left plunging into the suburbs of which we have afforded a short and necessary account this individual was dressed in simple attire but composed of excellent materials his vest was of dark velvet, slashed, but not embroidered, and on his breast he wore a jezeran, or mailed cuirass, which was not only lighter than a steel corslet, but was equally proof against poniard or pike. In his broad leather belt were stuck two pairs of pistols, and a long dagger, a heavy broadsword also hung by his side. His black boots came up nearly to the knee, in contravention of the prevailing fashion of that age, when these articles of dress seldom reached above the swell of the leg a large slouched hat without plumage or any ornament was drawn down as much as possible over his features 
and the broad mantello or cloak was gathered round the body in such a manner that it covered all the left side and the weapons fastened in the belt that left the sword arm free for use in any sudden emergency behind the wayfarer stretched the magnificent city of florence spreading over the deep vale on both sides of the arno and as usual brilliant with light like a world of stars shining in mimic rivalry of those that studded the purple vault above before him were the mazes of the alla croce the darkness of which suburb was only interrupted by a few straggling and feeble lights gleaming from houses of entertainment or from huts whose poverty required not the protection of shutters to the casements and now as one of those faint lights suddenly fell upon the wayfarer's countenance as he passed the abode in which it shone let us avail ourselves of the opportunity afforded by that glimpse to state that this man's features were handsome but coarse bearing the traces of a dissolute life his age was apparently forty it might even have been a few years more matured but his coal-black hair mustachio and bushy whiskers unstreaked by silver showed that time sat lightly on his head in spite of the evident intimacy with the wine-cup above alluded to having threaded the greater portion of the suburb which was almost knee-deep in mud for it had been raining nearly all day and had only cleared up after sunset the individual whom we have been describing stopped at the corner of a street and gave a shrill whistle the signal was immediately answered in a similar fashion and in a few minutes a man emerged from the darkness of a by-street he also was well armed but much more plainly dressed than the other and his countenance was such as would not have proved a very friendly witness in his favour in a court of justice lomellino said the first individual whom we have described in this chapter captain stefano responded the other all right my fine lad returned the bandit captain follow me the two robbers then proceeded in silence until they reached a house larger and stronger in appearance than any other in the same street the shutters which protected the casements were massive and strengthened with iron bars and huge nails somewhat after the fashion of church doors the walls were of solid grey stones whereas those of the adjacent huts were of mud or wood in a word this dwelling seemed a little fortress in the midst of an exposed and unprotected town before this house the robbers stopped do you remain on the other side of the street lomellino said the bandit chief and if need be you will answer to my accustomed signal good captain was the reply and lomellino crossed over the way to the deep shade of the houses on that side stefano then gave a low knock at the door of the well-defended dwelling above described several minutes elapsed and no sounds were heard within the old usurer is at home i know muttered stefano to himself for the moment he had knocked a gleam of light peeping through a crevice in an upper casement had suddenly disappeared he now rapped more loudly at the door with the handle of his heavy broadsword ah he comes muttered the bandit chief after another long pause who knocks so late demanded a weak and tremulous voice from within i stefano verina cried the brigand pompously open and fear not the bolts were drawn back a chain fell heavily on the stone floor inside and the door opened revealing the form of an old and venerable looking man with a long white beard he held a lamp in his hand and by its fitful glare his countenance of the jewish cast manifested an expression denoting the terror which he vainly endeavoured to conceal enter signor stefano said the old man but wherefore here so late late do you call it signor isaacar ejaculated the bandit crossing the threshold meseems there is yet time to do a world of business this night for those who have the opportunity and the inclination ah but you and yours turn night into day replied the jew with a chuckle intended to be of a conciliatory nature or rather you perform your avocations at a time when others sleep every one to his calling friend isaacar said the bandit chief come have you not made that door fast enough yet you will have to open it soon again for my visit will be none of the longest the jew having replaced the chains and fastened the huge bolts which protected the house door took up the lamp and led the way to a small and meanly furnished room at the back of his dwelling what business may have brought you hither to-night good captain verina he inquired in a tone of ill-subdued apprehension not to frighten thee out of thy wits good isaacar responded stefano laughing aha exclaimed the jew partially reassured perhaps you have come to repay me the few crowns i had the honour to lend you without security and without interest by my patron saint thou wast never more mistaken in thy life friend isaacar interrupted the robber chief 
the few crowns you speak of were neither more nor less than a tribute paid on consideration that my men should leave unscathed the dwelling of worthy isaacar ben solomon in other words that thy treasures should be safe at least from them well well be it so cried the jew heaven knows i do not grudge the amount in question although he added slowly i am compelled to pay almost an equal sum to the syndic the syndic of alla croce and the captain of the banditti are two very different persons returned stefano the magistrate protects you from those over whom he has control and i on my side guarantee you against the predatory visits of those over whom i exercise command but let us to business i to business echo the jew anxious to be relieved from the state of suspense into which this visit had thrown him you are acquainted with the young beautiful and wealthy countess of aristino isaacar said the bandit the jew stared at him in increased alarm now mingled with amazement but in spite of all her wealth continued stefano she was compelled to pledge her diamonds to thee to raise the money wherewith to discharge a gambling debt contracted by her lover the high-born handsome but ruined marquis of orsini how knowest thou all this inquired the jew from her ladyship's own lips responded stefano at least she told me she had raised the sum to accommodate a very particular friend now as the transaction is unknown to her husband and as i am well assured that the marquis of orsini is really on most excellent terms with her ladyship moreover as this same marquis did pay a certain heavy gambling debt within an hour after the diamonds were pledged to you it requires but little ingenuity to put all these circumstances together to arrive at the result which i have mentioned is it not so isaacar i know not the motive for which the money was raised answered the jew wondering what was coming next oh then the money was raised with you cried stefano and consequently you hold the diamonds i did not say so i a truth to this fencing with my words ejaculated the bandit impatiently i have an unconquerable desire to behold these diamonds you good captain murmured isaacar trembling from head to foot yes i and where i thought not is there anything so marvellous in a man of my refined tastes and exquisite notions taking a fancy to inspect the jewels of one of the proudest beauties of gay florence by my patron saint you should thank me that i come in so polite a manner to request a favour the granting of which i could so easily compel without all this tedious circumlocution the diamonds muttered the jew doubtless troubled at the idea of surrendering the security which he held for a very considerable loan perdition seize the man thundered stefano now waxing angry yes the diamonds i say and fortune will it be for you if they are produced without further parley thus speaking the bandit suffered his cloak to fall from over his belt and the jew's quick eye recoiled from the sight of those menacing weapons with which his visitor was armed as it were to the teeth then without further remonstrance but with many profound sighs isaacar proceeded to fetch a small iron box from another room and in a few moments the diamond case made of sandalwood inlaid with mother-of-pearl was in the bandit captain's hands let me convince myself that it is all right exclaimed stefano examining the lid of the case yes there are the arms of aristino with the ciphers of the countess g a guiella aristino a very pretty name by my troth ah how the stones sparkle he cried as he opened the case and the inventory is complete just as it was described to me by her ladyship you are a worthy man isaacar a good man you will have restored tranquillity to the mind of the beautiful countess continued stefano in a bantering tone and she will be enabled to appear at court to-morrow with her husband good-night isaacar my brave men shall receive orders to the effect that the first who dares to molest you may reckon upon swinging to the highest tree that i can find for his accommodation you violate your compact signor verina exclaimed the jew his rage now mastering his fears wherefore should i pay you tribute to protect me when you enter my house and rob me thus vilely in this case a lady is concerned good isaacar responded the bandit calmly and you know that with all true cavaliers the ladies are pre-eminent once more a fair night's repose my much respected friend thus saying stefano verina rose from the seat on which he had been lounging and the jew knowing that altercation and remonstrance were equally useless hastened to afford the means of egress to so unwelcome a visitor 
Stefano lingered a moment opposite the house until he heard the door bolted and chained behind him. Then, crossing the street, he rejoined his follower, Lomellino. "'All right, Captain?' said the latter, inquiringly. "'All right,' answered Stefano. "'Poor Isaacar is inconsolable, no doubt, but the Countess will be consoled at his expense. Thus it is with the world, Lomellino. What is one person's misery is another's happiness.' dost grow sentimental good captain exclaimed the man whose ears were entirely unaccustomed to such language on the part of his chief lomellino my friend answered verina when a man is smitten in a certain organ commonly called the heart he is apt to give utterance to that absurdity which the world denominates sentiment such is my case you are then in love captain said lomellino as they retraced their way through the suburb of alla croce just so replied the bandit captain i will tell you how it happened yesterday morning when those impertinent spiri gave me a harder run than i have ever yet experienced i was fain to take refuge in the garden of that very same signor wagner who was yesterday arrested for murder interrupted lomellino the identical one returned stefano i concealed myself so well that i knew i might bid defiance to those bungling spiri although their scent was sharpened by the hope of the reward set on my head by the prince while i thus lay hidden i beheld a scene that would have done good to the heart of even such a callous fellow as yourself i mean callous to female qualifications in a word i saw one woman stab another as effectively as but it was wagner who killed the woman ejaculated lomellino no such thing said stefano quietly the murderess is of the gentle sex though she can scarcely be gentle in disposition and such a splendid creature lomellino i beheld her countenance for a few minutes as she drew aside her veil that her eyes might glare upon her victim and i whispered to myself that woman must be mine she is worthy of me then the blow descended her victim lay motionless at her feet and i never took my eyes off the countenance of the murderess she is an incarnate fiend i thought and admirably fitted to mate with the bandit captain such was my reflection then and the lapse of a few hours has only served to strengthen the impression you may now judge whether i have formed an unworthy attachment she is worthy of you captain exclaimed lomellino know you who she is not a whit replied stefano verina i should have followed her when she left the garden and complimented her on her proficiency in handling a poniard but i was not so foolhardy as to stand the chance of meeting the spiri moreover i shall speedily adopt measures to discover who and what she is and when i present myself to her and we compare qualifications i do not think there can arise any obstacle to our happiness as lovers are accustomed to say then it was she who murdered the lady agnes said lomellino have i not told you so signor wagner is as innocent of that deed as the babe unborn but it is not for me to step forward in his behalf and therefore criminate a lady on whom i have set my affections that were hardly to be expected captain returned lomellino and all that i have now told thee thou wilt keep to thyself added stefano for to none else of the band do i speak so freely as to thee because no one is so devoted to his captain as i rejoined lomellino and now that we are about to separate added the man as they reached the verge of the suburb which was then divided by a wide open space from the city itself and might even be termed a detached village now that we are about to separate captain allow me to ask whether the affair of monday night still holds good the little business at the riverola palace you mean said stefano most assuredly you and piero will accompany me there is little danger to be apprehended and antonio has given me the necessary information count francisco sleeps at a great distance from the point where we must enter and as for his sister she is as deaf as if she had her ears sealed up but what about the pages the lackeys antonio will give them all a sleeping draught everything added the robber chief is settled as cleverly as can be antonio is your cousin if i err not said lomellino something of the kind replied stefano something of the kind but what is better and more binding we are friends and yet strange to say i never was within the precincts of the riverola mansion until the night before last and more singular still i have never to my knowledge seen any members of the family in whose service antonio has been so long why florence is not much honoured with your presence during the daytime observed lomellino and at night the great lords and high-born ladies who happen to be abroad are so muffled up 
the former in their cloaks the latter in their veils true true i understand all you would say lomellino interrupted the captain but you know how to be rather tedious at times here we separate i repair to the arestino palace and you to the cavern replied lomellino where i hope to sleep better than i did last night he added what a renewal of those infernal shriekings and screamings that seem to come from the bowels of the earth exclaimed the captain worse than ever answered lomellino if they continue much longer i must abandon my office of treasure-keeper which compels me to sleep in the innermost room that cannot be allowed my worthy friend interrupted the captain for i should not know whom to appoint in your place if it were not that we should not betray our own stronghold continued stefano emphatically we would force our way into the nest of our noisy neighbours and levy such a tribute upon them as would put them on their good behaviour for the future the scheme is really worth consideration remarked lomellino we will talk more of it another time said the captain good night lomellino i shall not return to the cavern until very late the two banditti then separated lomellino striking off to the right and stefano verina pursuing his way toward the most aristocratic quarter of florence upon entering the sphere of marble palaces brilliantly lighted villas and gay mansions the robber chief covered his face with a black mask a mode of disguise so common at that period not only amongst ladies but also with cavaliers and nobles that it was not considered at all suspicious save as a proof of amatory intrigue with which the sibiri had no right of interference End of section 22. Section 23 of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 22. The Countess of Aristino. We must now introduce our readers to a splendid apartment in the Aristino Palace. This room was tastefully decorated and elegantly furnished. The tapestry was of pale blue, and the ottomans, ranged around the walls in oriental style, were of rich crimson satin embroidered with gold. In the middle stood a table covered with ornaments and rich trinkets lately arrived from Paris, for France already began to exercise the influence of its superior civilization and refinement over the south of Europe. The ceiling of that room was a masterpiece of the united arts of sculpture and painting, first the hand of the sculptor had carved it into numerous medallions on which the pencil of the painter had then delineated the most remarkable scenes in early florentine history round the sides or cornices were beautifully sculptured in marble the heads of the principal ancestors of the count of aristino it was within half an hour of midnight and the beautiful guilia aristino was sitting restlessly upon an ottoman now holding her breath to listen as if a step were approaching the private door behind the tapestry then glancing anxiously towards a clepsydra on the mantel what can detain him thus will he deceive me she murmured to herself oh how foolish worse than foolish mad to confide in the promise of a professed bandit the jewels are worth a thousand times the reward i have pledged myself to give him wretched being that i am and then with her fair hand she drew back the dark masses of her hair that had fallen too much over her polished brow and on this polished brow she pressed that fair hand for her head ached with the intensity of mingled suspense and alarm her position was indeed a dangerous one as the reader is already aware in the infatuation of her strong unconquerable but not less guilty love for the handsome spendthrift orsini she had pledged her diamonds to isaacar ben solomon for an enormous sum of money every ducat of which had passed without an hour's delay into the possession of the young marquis those diamonds which were the bridal gift of her fond and attached but alas deceived husband who being many years older than herself studied constantly how to afford pleasure to his wife of whom he was so proud he was himself an extraordinary judge of the nature purity and value of precious stones and being immensely rich he had collected a perfect museum of curiosities in that peculiar department in fact it was his amateur study or as we should say in these times his peculiar hobby and hence the impossibility of imposing on him by the substitution of a hired or a false set of diamonds for those which he had presented to his wife it was therefore absolutely necessary to get these diamonds back from isaacar by fair means or foul the fair means were to redeem them by the payment of the loan advanced upon them but the sum was so large that the countess dared not make such a demand upon her husband's purse because the extravagance of her lover had lately compelled her to apply so very very frequently to the count for replenishment of her funds the foul means were therefore resorted to 
an old woman who had been the nurse of the countess in her infancy and to whom in her distress she applied for advice having procured for the patrician lady the services of stefano verina the bandit captain it was not to be wondered at then if the countess of aristino were a prey to the most poignant anxiety as each successive quarter of an hour passed without bringing either stefano or any tidings from him even if she feigned illness so as to escape the ceremony the following day relief would only be temporary for the moment she should recover or affect to recover her husband would again require her to accompany him to the receptions of the prince Guilia's anguish had risen to that point at which such feelings become intolerable and suggest the most desperate remedies suicide when a low knock behind the pale blue arras suddenly imparted hope to her soul hastily receiving the tapestry on that side whence the sound had emanated she drew back the bolt of a little door communicating with a private staircase usually found in all italian mansions of that period and the robber chief entered the room have you succeeded was guilia's rapid question your ladyship's commission has been executed replied stefano who we should observe had laid aside his black mask ere he appeared in the presence of the countess ah now i seem to live breathe again cried guilia a tremendous weight suddenly removed from her mind stefano produced the jewel case from beneath his cloak and as the countess hastily took it nay almost snatched it from him he endeavoured to imprint a kiss upon her fair hand deep was the crimson glow which suffused her countenance her neck even all that was revealed of her bosom as she drew haughtily back and with a sublime patrician air of offended pride i thank you thank you from the bottom of my soul signor verina she said in another moment for she felt how completely circumstances had placed her in the power of the bandit chief and how useless it was to offend him here is your reward and she presented him a heavy purse of gold nay keep the jingling metal lady said stefano i stand in no need of it at least for the present the reward i crave is of a different nature and will even cost you less than you proffer me what other recompense can i give you demanded guilia painfully alarmed a few lines written by thy fair hand to my dictation answered stefano guilia cast upon him a look of profound surprise here lady take my tablets for i see that your own are not at hand cry the chief delay not it grows late and we may be interrupted we may indeed murmured guilia darting a rapid look at the water clock it is within a few minutes of midnight she might have added and at midnight i expect a brief visit from manuel d'orsini ere the return of my husband from a banquet at a friend's villa but of course this was her secret and anxious to rid herself of the company of stefano she took the tablets with trembling hands and prepared to write i guilla countess of arestino began the brigand dictating to her confess myself to owe stefano verina a deep debt of gratitude for his kindness in recovering my diamonds from the possession of the jew isaacar to whom they were pledged for a sum which i could not pay but wherefore this document exclaimed the countess looking up in a searching manner at the robber chief for she had seated herself at the table to write and he was leaning over the back of her chair tis my way at times he answered carelessly when i perform some service for a noble lord or a great lady to solicit an acknowledgment of this kind in preference to gold then sinking his voice to a low whisper he added with an air of deep meaning who knows but that this document may some day save my head guilia uttered a faint shriek for she comprehended in a moment how cruelly she might sooner or later be compromised through that document and how entirely she was placing herself in the bandit's power but stefano's hand clutched the tablets whereon the countess had almost mechanically written to his subtle dictation and he said coolly fear not lady i must be reduced to a desperate strait indeed when my safety shall depend on the use i can make of this fair handwriting guilia felt partially relieved by this assurance and it was with ill-concealed delight that she acknowledged the ceremonial bow with which the bandit chief intimated his readiness to depart but at that moment three low and distinct knocks were heard at the little door behind the arras guilia's countenance became suffused with blushes then instantly recovering her presence of mind she said in a rapid earnest tone he who is coming knows nothing concerning the jewels and will be surprised to find a stranger with me perhaps he may even recognize you perhaps he knows you by sight what would you have me do lady demanded stefano speak and i obey you conceal yourself here and i will soon release you she raised the tapestry on the side opposite to that by which stefano had entered the room and the robber chief hid himself in the wide interval between the hangings and the wall 
All this had scarcely occupied a minute, and Giulia now hastened to open the private door, which instantly gave admittance to the young, handsome, and dissipated Marquis of Orsini. End of section 23《Section 24 of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 23 The Love of Woman, Guilia and Her Lover. Silence and calmness and moonlight were without the walls of the Aristino villa, for the goddess of night shone sweetly but coldly on the city of Florence, and asserted her empire even over the clouds that ere now had seemed laden with storm nor beamed she there alone that fair diana for a countless host of handmaidens the silver-faced stars had spread themselves over the deep purple sky and there there they all shone in subdued and modest glory those myriads of beacons floating on the eternal waves of that far-off and silent sea shine on sweet regent of the night and ye too silver-faced stars whose countenances are reflected and multiplied endlessly as they are rocked to and fro on the deep blue bosom of the arno while on the banks of that widely famed stream nature herself as if wearied of her toils appears to be sleeping would that the soul of man could thus lie down in its night of sorrow or of racking passion on the margin of the waters of hope confident that the slumber of contentment and peace will seal his eyelids heavy with long vigils in a world where conflicting interests need constant watching and that the stillness of the unfathomable depths of those waters will impart its influence unto him for oh if calmness silence and moonlight prevail without the walls of the aristino villa yet within there be hearts agitated by passions and emotions from which the gentle genius of slumber shrinks back aghast in the brilliantly lighted apartment to which we have already introduced our readers the countess guilia receives her lover the dissipated but handsome marquis of orsini the bandit captain is concealed behind the richly worked tapestry and at the door not the little private one of that room an old man is listening an old man whose ashy pale countenance clinched hands quivering white lips and wildly rolling eyes indicate how terrible are the feelings which agitate within his breast this old man was the count of aristino one of the mightiest nobles of the republic naturally his heart was good and his disposition kind and generous but then he was an italian and he was jealous need we say more to account for the change which had now taken place in his unusually calm tranquil yet dignified demeanour or shall we inform our readers that at the banquet to which he had been invited at a friend's villa that evening he had overheard two young nobles in a conversation which the generous wine they had been too freely imbibing rendered indiscreetly loud couple the names of guilia aristino his own much-loved wife and manuel d'orsini in a manner which suddenly excited a fearful a blasting suspicion in his mind stealing away unperceived from the scene of revelry the count had returned unattended to the immediate vicinity of his mansion and from the shade of a detached building he had observed the marquis of orsini traverse the gardens and enter a portico leading to the private staircase communicating with that wing of the palace which contained the suite of apartments occupied by guilia this was enough to strengthen the suspicion already excited in the old nobleman's mind but not quite sufficient to confirm it the countess had several beautiful girls attached to her person and the marquis might have stooped to an intrigue with one of them the lord of aristino was therefore resolved to act with the caution of a prudent man but he was also prepared to avenge in case of the worst with the spirit of an italian he hurried round to the principal entrance of his palace and gave some brief but energetic instructions to a faithful valet who instantly departed to execute them the count then ascended the marble staircase traversed the corridors leading toward his lady's apartments and placed himself against the door of that one wherein guilia had already received her lover thus while silence and calmness and moonlight reign without yet within the walls of the aristino mansion a storm has gathered to explode fearfully and all throughout the unlawful but not less ardent love of guilia for the spendthrift marquis of orsini 
sober-minded men philosophic reasoners persons of business habits stern moralists all these may ridicule the poet or the novelist who makes love his everlasting theme they may hug themselves in the apathy of their own cold hearts with the belief that all the attributes of the passion have been immeasurably exaggerated but they are in error deeply profoundly indisputably in error for love in its various phases among which are jealousy suspicion infidelity rivalry and revenge has agitated the world from time immemorial has overthrown empires has engendered exterminating wars and has extended its despotic sway alike over the gorgeous city of a consummate civilization and the miserable wigwam of a heathen barbarism who then can wonder if the theme of love be universal that it should have evoked the rude and iron eloquence of the scandinavian skull as well as the soft and witching posy of the bards of more genial climes or that its praises or its sorrow should be sung on the banks of the arno the seine or the thames as well as amidst the pathless forests of america or the burning sands of africa or in the far-off islands of the southern seas but alas it is thou o oh woman who art called on to make the most cruel sacrifices at the altar of this impervious deity love if thou lovest honourably tis well but if thou lovest unlawfully how wretched is thy fate the lover for whose sake thou hast forgotten thy duties as a wife has sacrificed nothing to thee whilst thou hast sacrificed everything to him let the amour be discovered and who suffers thou he loses not caste station name nor honour thou art suddenly robbed of all these the gilded saloons of fashion throw open their doors to the seducer but bars of adamant defend that entrance against the seduced for his sake thou risketh contumely shame reviling scorn and the lingering death of a breaking heart for thee he would risk not one millionth part of all that shouldst thou be starving say to him go forth and steal to give me bread dare the dishonour of the deed and make the sacrifice of thy good name for me or go and forge or swindle or lie foully so that thou bringest me bread for have i not dared dishonour made the sacrifice of my good name and done as much ay far more than all that for thee shouldst thou poor seduced weak one address thy seducer thus he will look upon thee as a fiend-like tempter he will rush from thy sight he will never see thee more his love will be suddenly converted into hatred yes man demands that woman should dishonour herself for his sake but he will not allow a speck to appear upon what he calls his good name no not to save that poor confiding lost creature from the lowest depths and dregs of penury into which her frailty may have plunged her such is the selfishness of man where is his chivalry but let us return to the aristino palace the moment manuel d'orsini entered the apartment by means of the private door he embraced guilia with a fondness which was more than half affected at least on that occasion and she herself returned the kiss less warmly than usual but this was because she was constrained and embarrassed by the presence of the bandit captain who was concealed behind the tapestry you appear cool distant guilia said manuel casting upon her an inquiring glance and you either love me less or you have something on your mind returned the countess in a low tone in the first instance you are wrong in the second you are right my well-beloved answered the marquis but tell me speak lower manuel we may be overheard some of my dependents are in the adjacent room and and you wish me to depart as soon as possible no doubt said the marquis impatiently oh manuel how can you reproach me thus asked guilia in a voice scarcely above a whisper for that woman who dared to be unfaithful to her husband revolted from the thought that a coarse-minded bandit should be in a position to overhear her conversation with her lover how can you reproach me thus manuel she repeated have i not given thee all the proofs of tenderest love which woman can bestow have i not risked everything for thee i do not reproach you guilia he replied pressing his hand to his brow but i am unhappy miserable and he flung himself upon the nearest ottoman oh what has occurred to distract thee thus exclaimed the countess forgetting the presence of stefano verina in the all-absorbing interest of her lover's evident grief am i ever to find thee oppressed with care thee who art so young and so gloriously handsome she added her voice suddenly sinking to a whisper manuel gazed for a few moments without speaking on the countenance of his mistress as she leant over him then in a deep hollow tone 
a tone the despair of which was too real and natural to be in the slightest degree affected he said guilia i am a wretch unworthy of all this sweet love of thine i have broken the solemn vow which i pledged to thee i have violated my oath oh manuel ejaculated the countess still forgetting the presence of the bandit thou hast gambled once more and lost cried the marquis wildly and the sum that i am bound in honour to pay on monday by noon is nearly equal in amount to that which thy generosity lent me the other day holy virgin aid you my unhappy manuel said guilia for thou canst not exclaimed the young noble with a profound sigh oh i am well aware that i have no claim upon thee ah wherefore that reproach for reproach it is interrupted the countess no claim on thee hast thou not my heart and in giving thee that manual i laid at thy feet a poor offering which though so poor yet absorbs all others of which i may dispose do not reproach me manual for i would lay down my life to save thy soul from pain or thy name from dishonour now art thou my own guilia cried the marquis pressing her hand to his lips an accursed fatality seems to hang over me this habit of gaming entraps me as the wine-cup fascinates the biber who would fain avoid it but cannot listen to me for one moment guilia in the public casino which as thou well knowest is a place of resort where fortunes are lost and won in an hour ay sometimes in a minute i have met a man whose attire is good and whose purse is well filled but whose countenance i like as little as i should that of the captain of the sbirri or his lieutenant if i had committed a crime this individual of whom i speak for i know not his name was a favoured votary of dame fortune who won of me that sum which thy kindness guilia alone enabled me to pay but a few days past and now i am a second time this man's debtor an hour ago he entered the casino he stayed but for ten minutes and in that time o oh, manuel is not this conduct of thine something bordering on madness interrupted the countess and if thou art thus wedded to that fatal habit how canst thou find room in thy heart for a single gleam of affection for me now dost thou reproach me in thy turn guilia exclaimed the young marquis but believe me my angel he continued exerting all his powers to bend her to his purpose believe me when i declare oh most solemnly declare by all that i put faith in and by all that i hope for hereafter that i could be relieved from this embarrassment extricated from this difficulty heavens how can it be done interrupted the countess casting her eyes wildly round for the time was passing she suddenly remembered that the bandit was still concealed in the room and then her husband might return earlier than was expected oh if you despair of the means guilia said the marquis i must fly from florence i must exile myself for ever from the city of my birth and which is still more endeared to me because he added sinking his voice to a tender tone because my well-beloved it contains thee no manuel you must not quit florence and leave a dishonoured name behind thee exclaimed this lovely woman who was thus sublimely careful of the reputation of him for whom she had so long compromised her own what can be done would that i had the means to raise the sum it is with shame that i suggest said manuel what speak speak the means the jewels dearest thy diamonds merciful heavens if you did but know all cried guilia almost frantically these diamonds were pledged to the jew isaacar ben solomon to raise the sum with which thy last debt was paid manuel and but forgive me if i did not tell thee all this before not half an hour has elapsed since she stopped short for she knew that the bandit overheard every syllable she uttered nor had she time even if she possessed the power to continue her most painful explanation for scarcely had she thus paused abruptly when the door burst open and the count of aristino stood in the presence of the guilty pair End of section 24section twenty five of wagner the werewolf by george w m reynolds this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty four the injured husband the guilty wife and the insolent lover in the fury of heart and agony of mind rushed the old lord into that apartment oh how had he even been able to restrain himself so long while listening at the door it was that the conversation between his wife and the marquis had as the reader is aware been carried on in so low a tone especially on the side of the countess that he had not been able to gather sufficient to place beyond all doubt the guilt of that fair creature and even in the midst of his italian ire 
he had clung to the hope that she might have been imprudent but not culpable as yet oh in this case how gladly would that old lord have forgiven the past on condition of complete reformation for the future he would have removed his young wife afar from the scene of temptation to a distant estate which he possessed and there by gentle remonstrances and redoubled attention he would have sought to bind her to him by the links of gratitude and respect if not by those of love but this dream so honourable to that old man's heart was not to be realised for scarcely was it conceived when the discourse of the youthful pair turned upon the diamonds those diamonds which he had given her on the bridal day giulia spoke clearly and plainly enough then in spite of the presence of the bandit in that chamber for she was about to explain to her lover how willingly she would comply with his suggestion to raise upon the jewels the sum he again required a readiness on her part which might be corroborated by the fact that she had already once had recourse to this expedient and for him but she dared not adopt the same course again as her husband might detect the absence of the valuables ere she could obtain funds to redeem them when she acknowledged to her lover that these diamonds were pledged to the jew isaacar ben solomon to raise the sum with which thy last debt was paid it flashed to the old nobleman's mind that his wife had exhibited some little confusion when he had spoken to her a day or two previously concerning her jewels and now it was clear that they had been used as a means to supply the extravagances of an unprincipled spendthrift how could he any longer cling to the hope that giulia was imprudent only and not guilty must she not be guilty to have made so large a sacrifice and run so great a risk for the sake of the marquis of orsini it was under the influence of these excited feelings that the count of aristino burst into the room fortunately so far as outward appearance went there was nothing more to confirm the old nobleman's suspicions the youthful pair were not locked in each other's arms their hands were not even joined manuel was seated on the sofa and giulia was standing at a short distance from him but conscious guilt elicited a faint scream from her lips and the boiling blood after rushing to her countenance seemed to ebb away as rapidly again leaving her beauteous face as pale as marble while she clung to the mantelpiece for support i am glad that your lordship is returned said the marquis rising from his seat and advancing toward the count in a manner so insolently cool and apparently self-possessed that giulia was not only astonished but felt her courage suddenly revive i was determined however uncourteous the intrusion and unseemly the hour to await your lordship's coming and as her ladyship assured me that you would not tarry late my lord marquis interrupted the old nobleman who was himself so taken by surprise at this unembarrassed mode of address that he began to fancy his ears must have deceived him and his suspicions beguiled him on what business could you possibly have needed my services at this late hour i will explain myself returned orsini he was a perfect adept in the art of dissimulation and who never losing his presence of mind embraced at a glance the whole danger of giulia's position and his own and the probability that their conversation might have been overheard i was explaining to her ladyship the temporary embarrassment under which i lay and from which i hoped that your friendship might probably release me and her ladyship spoke of diamonds did she not demanded the count addressing himself to the marquis but fixing a keen and penetrating glance on giulia her ladyship was remonstrating with me on my extravagances hastily replied the marquis and was repeating to me i must say in a manner too impressive to be agreeable the words which my own sister had used to me a few days ago when explaining as a motive for refusing me the succour which i needed that she actually had been compelled to pledge her diamonds ah they were your sister's diamonds that were pledged to isaacar the jew said the count half ironically and half in doubt for he was fairly bewildered by the matchless imprudence of the young marquis yes my lord my dear sister who alas is ruining herself to supply me with the means of maintaining my rank and as my sister and her ladyship the countess are on the most friendly terms as you are well aware it is not surprising if she should have communicated the secret of the diamonds to her ladyship and also beg her ladyship to remonstrate with me well my lord interrupted the count impatiently your own private affairs have no particular interest for me at this moment and as for any business on which you may wish to speak to me i shall be pleased if you postpone it till to-morrow your lordship's wishes are commands with me said manuel with a polite salutation and having made a low bow to giulia he quitted the room not by the private door be it well understood but by that which had ere now admitted the count of aristino the moment the door had closed behind the marquis of orsini the count approached his wife and said in a cold severe manner your ladyship receives visitors at a late hour he glanced as he spoke toward the dial of the clepsydra 
and Guilia followed his look in the same direction. It was half an hour after midnight. The Marquis explained to your lordship, or partially so, the motive of his importune visit, said Guilia, endeavouring to appear calm and collected. The Marquis is an unworthy, reckless, unprincipled young man, exclaimed the Count, fixing a stern, searching gaze upon Guilia's countenance, as if with the iron of his words he would probe the depths of her soul. He is a confirmed gamester, overwhelmed with debts, and has tarnished, by his profligacy, the proud name that he bears. Even the friendship which existed for many, many years between his deceased father and myself shall no longer induce me to receive at this house a young man whose reputation is all but tainted, even in a city of dissipation and debauchery, such as, alas, the once glorious Florence has become, for his immorality is not confined to gaming and wanton extravagance. Continued the Count, his glance becoming more keen, as his words fell like drops of molten lead upon the heart of Guilia. But his numerous intrigues amongst women, his perfidy to those confiding and deceived fair ones. Surely, my lord, said the Countess, vainly endeavouring to subdue the writhings of torture which this language excited. Surely the Marquis d'Orsini is wronged by the breath of scandal. No, Guilia, he is an unprincipled spendthrift, returned the Count, who never once took his eyes off his wife's countenance while he was speaking. An unprincipled spendthrift, he added emphatically, a man lost to all sense of honour, a ruined gamester, a heartless seducer, a shame, a blot, a stigma upon the aristocracy of Florence. And now that you are acquainted with his real character, you will recognise the prudence of the step which I shall take to-morrow, that is, to inform him that henceforth the Count and Countess of Aristino must decline to receive him again at their villa. What think you, Guilia? Your lordship is the master to command, and it is my duty to obey, answered the Countess, but her voice was hoarse and thick, the acutest anguish was rending her soul, and its intensity almost choked her utterance. She is guilty, thought the Count within himself, and to subdue an abrupt explosion of his rage, until he had put the last and most certain test to his lady's faith, he walked twice up and down the room. Then, feeling that he had recovered his powers of self-control, he said, "'Tomorrow, Guilia, is the reception day of his highness the duke, and I hope thou hast made suitable preparations to accompany me in the manner becoming the wife of the Count of Aristino.' can your lordship suppose for an instant that i should appear in the ducal presence otherwise than it is meet and fitting for her who has the honour to bear your name said guilia partially recovering her presence of mind as the conversation appeared to have taken a turn no longer painful to her feelings for oh cannot the reader conceive the anguish the mortal anguish she had ere now endured when her husband was heaping ashes on the reputation of her lover i do not suppose that your ladyship will neglect the preparations due to your rank and to that name which you esteem it an honour to bear and which no living being should dishonour with impunity Guilia quailed writhing beneath the searching glance which now literally glared upon her nevertheless continued the count i was fearful you might have forgotten that to-morrow is the reception day and while i think of it permit me to examine your diamonds for a few minutes to convince myself that the settings are in good order as you know he added with a strange unearthly kind of laugh that i am skilled in the jeweller's craft the old man paused but he thought within himself now what subterfuge can she invent if my suspicions be really true and if my ears did not ere now deceive me how profound then was his astonishment when guilia with the calm and tranquil demeanour which innocence usually wears but with the least least curl of the upper lip as if in haughty triumph, leisurely and deliberately drew the jewel-case from beneath the cushion of the ottoman whereon she was seated, and, handing it to him, said, Your lordship perceives that I had not forgotten the reception which his highness holds to-morrow, since I ere now brought my diamonds hither to select those which it is my intention to wear. The count could have pressed her hand as he took the case in his own. He could have fallen at her feet and demanded pardon for the suspicions which she had entertained for it now seemed certain beyond all possibility of doubt that the explanation volunteered by the marquis was a true one yes he could have humbled himself in her presence but his italian pride intervened and he proceeded to examine the diamonds with no other view than to gain time to reflect how he should account for the abrupt manner in which he had entered the room ere now and for the chilling behaviour he had maintained toward his wife on her side Guilia, relieved of a fearful weight of apprehension, was only anxious for this scene to have a speedy termination, that she might release the rubber captain from his imprisonment behind the tapestry. 
three or four minutes of profound silence now ensued but suddenly the count started and uttered an ejaculation of mingled rage and surprise Giulia's blood ran cold to her very heart's core she scarcely knew why the suspense was not however long though most painful for dashing the jewel case with its contents upon the table the old nobleman approached her with quivering lips and a countenance ghastly white exclaiming vile woman thinkest thou to impose upon me thus the diamonds i gave thee are gone the stones set in their place are counterfeit Giulia gazed up toward her husband's countenance for a few moments in a manner expressive of blank despair then falling on her knees before him clasping her hands together she screamed frantically pardon pardon ah then it is all indeed too true murmured the old nobleman staggering as if with a blow but recovering his balance he stamped his foot resolutely upon the floor and drawing himself up to his full height while he half averted his eyes from his kneeling wife he exclaimed lost guilty abandoned woman how canst thou implore pardon at my hands for pardon is mercy and what mercy hast thou shown to me Quelia, i am descended from an old and mighty race and tradition affords no room to believe that any one who has borne the name of aristino has dishonoured it until now o oh, fool dotard idiot that i was to think that a young girl could love an aged man like me for old age is a weed which when twined round the plant of love becomes like the deadly nightshade and robs the rose-bush of its health alas alas i thought that in my declining years i should have one to cheer me one who might respect me if she could not love me one who would manifest some gratitude for the proud position i have given her and the boundless wealth that it would have been my joy to leave her and now that hope is gone withered crushed blighted woman by thy perfidy oh wherefore did you accompany the old man to the altar if only to deceive him wherefore do you consent to become his bride if but to plunge him into the depth of misery you weep ah weep on and all those tears be they even so scolding as to make seams on that too fair face cannot wipe away the stain which is now fixed to the haughty name of aristino weep on guilia but thy tears cannot move me now and the old lord's tone changed suddenly from the deep touching pathos of tremulousness to a stern fixed cold severity which stifled the germs of hope that had taken birth in the heart of his guilty wife mercy mercy she shrieked endeavouring to grasp his hand no thundered the count of aristino and he rang violently a silver bell which stood upon the table holy virgin what will become of me for what fate am i destined implored guilia frantically the old nobleman approached her gazed on her sternly for nearly a minute then bending down said in a hollow sepulchral tone thou art doomed to eternal seclusion in the convent of the carmelites he then turned hastily round and advanced to the door to which steps were already distinctly heard drawing near in the corridor for an instant guilia seemed paralysed by the dreadful announcement that had been made to her but suddenly a ray of hope flashed in her mind and darting toward that part of the tapestry behind which the robber was concealed she said in a low rapid tone thou hast heard the fate that awaits me i charge thee to seek manuel d'orsini and let him know all fear not lady you shall be saved answered stefano in a scarcely audible but yet profoundly emphatic whisper she had only just time to turn away when the count's faithful valet accompanied by three nuns wearing their black veils over their faces entered the room half an hour afterward the carmelite convent received another inmate end of section twenty five Section twenty six of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty five The Marquis of Orsini. Upon quitting the Aristino Palace, the Marquis of Orsini suddenly lost that bold, insolent, self sufficient air with which he had endeavoured to deceive the venerable Count whose wife he had dishonoured. For dishonour now menaced him where could he raise the sum necessary to liquidate the debt which he had contracted with a stranger at the casino or gaming-house and as the person to whom he found himself thus indebted was a stranger a total stranger to him he had no apology to offer for a delay in the payment of the money due perdition he exclaimed aloud as he issued rapidly from the grounds attached to the aristino mansion is there no alternative save flight guilia cannot assist me her jewels are gone they are pledged to the jew isaacar she was telling me so when the count broke in upon us 
what course can i adopt what plan pursue shall the name of orsini be dishonoured that proud name which for three centuries has been maintained spotless no no this must not be and in a state of most painful excitement so painful indeed that it amounted almost to a physical agony the marquis hastened rapidly through the mazes of the sleeping city reckless whither he was going but experiencing no inclination to repair to his own abode the fact of the diamonds of his mistress having been pledged to isaacar ben solomon was uppermost in his mind the reader must remember that he was unaware of the circumstance of their restoration to guilia as it was at the moment when she was about to give him this explanation that the old lord of aristino had interrupted their discourse the diamonds then constituted the pivot on which his thoughts now revolved they seemed to shine like stars amidst the deep haze which hung upon his mind could he not possess himself of them the name of orsini would be dishonoured if the gambling debt were not paid and one bold one desperate step might supply him with the means to save himself from the impending ruin the imminent disgrace but as the thoughts encouraged by those simple words the diamonds assumed a more palpable shape in his imagination he shrank back dismayed from the deed which they suggested for gamester debauchy spendthrift as he was he had never yet perpetuated an act that could be termed a crime the seduction of the countess of aristino was not a crime in his estimation oh no because a man may seduce and yet may not be dishonoured in the eyes of the world it is his victim or the partner of his guilty pleasure only who is dishonoured such is the law written in society's conventional code vile detestable unjust law to weigh in balance the reasons for or against the perpetuation of a crime to pause only for an instant to reflect whether the deed shall or shall not be done this is to yield at once to the temptation the desperate man who hovers hesitatingly between right and wrong invariably adopts the latter course and manuel of orsini was not an exception to the general rule silence and calmness and moonlight were still spread over the city of flowers while the marquis pursued the path leading to the suburb of alla croce and the silver-faced stars shone on shone on brightly and sweetly as the young nobleman knocked at the well-protected door of isaacar ben solomon for a long time his summons remained unanswered and he repeated it several times ere it received the slightest attention at last a casement was opened slowly on the upper story and the jew demanded who sought admittance at that hour tis i the marquis of orsini exclaimed the nobleman a thousand pardons my lord i come directly answered the jew not daring to offend a scion of the omnipotent aristocracy of florence yet filled with some misgivings the more painful because they were so vague and undefined in a few moments manuel was admitted into the abode of isaacar ben solomon who carefully barred and bolted the door again ere he even thought of alleviating his acute suspense by inquiring the nobleman's business deign to enter this humble apartment my lord said the jew at length as he conducted the marquis into the same room where he had a few hours previously received the bandit captain isaacar exclaimed manuel flinging himself upon a seat you behold a desperate man before you alas my lord what can a poor aged and obscure individual like myself do to assist so great and powerful and noble as your lordship said the jew in a trembling tone what can you do repeated the marquis much everything old man but listen patiently for a few moments only a noble lady's fame honour reputation are at stake and i am the guilty unhappy cause of the danger that threatens her to minister to my necessity she has pledged her jewels yes yes my lord i understand said isaacar trembling from head to foot it is a plan by no means unusual nowadays in florence her husband suspects the fact and has commanded her to produce her diamonds to-morrow her diamonds articulated the jew in a stifling tone yes her diamonds exclaimed manuel emphatically and they are in your possession now do you understand me i i my lord let us not waste time in idle words isaacar cried the marquis will you permit this scandal to be discovered and involve the countess of aristino myself i and yourself old man in danger and perhaps ruin perhaps did i say nay that ruin is certain to fall upon her certain almost to overwhelm you for the count of aristino is a councillor of state and added manuel with slow measured emphasis the dungeons of the inquisition open at his commands to receive the heretic or the jew isaacar ben solomon vainly endeavoured to reply 
fear choked his utterance and he sank trembling and faint upon a low ottoman where he sat the picture of dumb despair ruin then awaits the countess ruin and the inquisition yawn to engulf you and dishonour in having involved that noble lady in such a labyrinth of perils attends upon me continued orsini perceiving that his dark threats had produced the effect which he desired my lord my lord gasped the unfortunate israelite he could not close his eyes against the truth the terrible truth of the prospect submitted to his contemplation it is for you to decide against the ruin of one two three persons yourself being he who will if possible suffer most resumed the marquis impressively it is i say for you to decide between exposure and the inquisition on one hand and the surrender of those paltry diamonds on the other the diamonds the diamonds they are gone exclaimed the jew his voice becoming almost frantic with the wild hope that suddenly struck him of being able to shift the danger from his own head to that of another the captain of banditti stefano verina was here a few hours ago here in this very room and he sat where your lordship now sits well well cried the marquis impatiently for his heart began to grow sick with the fear of disappointment in respect to his plan of obtaining the diamonds of his mistress and stefano verina took them from me basely vilely wrenched them as it were from my grasp continued the jew tis false a miserable subterfuge on your part ejaculated the marquis starting from his seat and striding in a menacing manner toward isaacar ben solomon tis true i will give your lordship the proof cried the jew and manuel fell back a few paces stefano came and told me all he said that the countess had pledged her jewels for the sake of her lover of you my lord you the marquis of orsini twas to pay a gambling debt which your lordship had contracted and that debt was paid within an hour or two from the moment when the sum was advanced on the diamonds moreover continued isaachar still speaking in a rapid excited tone moreover stefano was hired by the countess to regain them from me liar thundered the marquis again rushing toward the defenceless old man patience my lord patience for an instant and you will see that i am no utterer of base falsehoods the robber captain examined the diamonds carefully yes most carefully and while occupied in the scrutiny he let drop expressions which convinced me that he was hired by the countess the inventory is complete he said just as it was described to me by her ladyship you are a worthy man isaachar he added you will have restored tranquillity to the mind of this beautiful countess and she will be enabled to appear at court to-morrow with her husband now does your lordship believe me the marquis was staggered for several minutes he made no answer was it possible that the countess of aristina could have employed the dreaded chieftain of the florentine banditti to wrest her diamonds from the possession of isaachar or had the jew invented the tale for an obvious purpose the latter alternative scarcely seemed feasible how could isaachar have learned that the sum raised was for the payment of a gambling debt Giulio would not have told him so again how had he learned that this debt had been paid within an hour or two after the money was procured and how had he ascertained that the countess had actually required her diamonds to accompany her husband the count perdition ejaculated orsini bewildered by conflicting ideas suspicions and alarms and he paced the room with agitated steps nearly a quarter of an hour elapsed the silence being occasionally broken by some question which the marquis put to the jew and to which the latter had his reply ready and each question thus put and every answer thus given only served to corroborate isaachar's tale and banish hope still further from the breast of the ruined nobleman at length the latter stopped short hesitated for a few moments as if wrestling with some idea or scheme that had taken possession of his mind then turning abruptly toward the jew he said in a deep hollow tone isaachar i need gold 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 my lord ejaculated the jew all his fears returning surely surely my lord her ladyship will supply you with fool dolt cried the marquis terribly excited do not see that she herself is menaced with ruin that the villain stefano must have kept the diamonds for himself that is granting your tale be true at this moment there was an authoritative knock at the house door this is stefano verina himself exclaimed the jew i know his manner of knocking with the rude handle of his sword what can he want what will become of me stefano verina say you cried the marquis hastily then admit him by all means and the possession of the diamonds of the countess shall be disputed between him and me at the sword's point manuel d'orsini was naturally brave 
and the desperate position in which he was placed rendered his tone and bearing so resolute so determined that isaachar feared lest blood should be shed in his dwelling my lord my lord he said in an imploring tone depart or conceal yourself silence signor ejaculated the marquis and hasten to admit the captain of banditti i have heard much of stefano verina and would fain behold this formidable chieftain the jew proceeded with trembling limbs and ghastly countenance to obey the orders of the marquis and in a few moments he returned to the room accompanied by stefano verina End of section 26section twenty seven of wagner the werewolf by george w m reynolds this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty six a combat the despised and persecuted israelite isaachar had taken away the lamp with him to give admission to the bandit and the marquis had remained for a few instants in the dark when the jew reappeared bearing the light orsini's first and natural impulse was to cast a rapid searching glance at the brigand captain at the same moment this individual burst into a loud coarse joyous laugh and the marquis to his profound surprise recognized in stefano verina the person with whom he had twice played so unsuccessfully at the gambling-house good my lord exclaimed verina flinging himself upon the ottoman which the jew had ere now occupied there is not in all florence a man whom i would rather have encountered than yourself you are somewhat pressing for the trifle the miserable trifle in which i am indebted to you signor said the marquis haughtily seeing that scarce two hours have it lapsed since i lost the amount at the casino sure who alluded to the affair save yourself cried stefano it was for another motive yes and i also wish to see signor stefano verina for another motive exclaimed manuel emphatically ah then you know me my lord said the bandit and yet methought i was a stranger to you although you were none to me at the casino you were a stranger until now continued orsini but isaachar knew by the knock which you dealt so lustily on his door who was his visitor and your lordship was desirous to see me very much so i believe you expressed a similar wish precisely my lord returned stefano but as you hold the higher rank in the world precedence in the way of explanation belongs to your lordship it is rather an explanation which i seek than one which i have to give rejoined manuel in a cold but resolute manner in a word my business with thee is touching the diamonds of the duchess of aristino and my business with your lordship is touching the countess herself observed verina also in a cool and deliberate manner ah cried the marquis with a sudden start yes my lord but this is no place for explanations on that head added stefano glancing toward the jew i understand you signor we must confer alone said the marquis we will go out together presently but in the meantime one word concerning the diamonds with which the countess of aristino employed me to procure for her exclaimed stefano finishing the nobleman's sentence for him i presume that old isaachar here has informed you of the particulars of my previous visit to him this night or rather last night for it is now the sabbath morning i am well informed of those particulars sir captain returned manuel but i would fain know what has become of the jewels which you obtained from isaachar i might with reason question your lordship's right to catechise me ah villain would you dare exclaimed the marquis his countenance becoming flushed with rage for he imagined that the robber chief was trifling with him far as you are beneath me wide as is the gulf that separates the marquis of orsini from the prescribed bravo yet will i consent to wreck upon thee base-born as thou art that vengeance which the law has not yet been able to inflict and manuel unsheathed his weapon with such rapidity that the polished blade of milan steel flashed like lightning in the glare of the lamp since this is your object i will bear with your humour muttered stefano starting from his seat and drawing a heavy sword my lord good signor verina in mercy not here i implore ejaculated the jew speaking in a piteous tone and wringing his hands in alarm at this hostile demonstration stand back thundered the bandit chief and the jew retreated to the most remote corner of the room where he fell upon his knees and began to offer up prayers that no blood would be spilt for he was a humane and kind-hearted man the marquis and the captain of banditti crossed their weapons and the combat began 
the former was lighter younger and therefore more active than his opponent but the latter was far more experienced in the use of his sword and moreover the space was too narrow to enable the marquis to gain any advantage from his superior agility the fight lasted about ten minutes when the bandit parried a desperate thrust that was made at him by his opponent and at the next moment wounded the marquis in the sword arm the weapon fell from manuel's hand and he stood at the mercy of his conqueror you are wounded my lord and the blood is flowing cried stefano hasten friend isaacar and fetch water bandages it is nothing a mere scratch exclaimed the marquis tearing away with his left hand the right sleeve of his doublet and displaying a tolerably severe gash which ran down the forearm lengthwise and from which the blood trickled on to the floor be kind enough to bind it with my scarf signor verina and let us continue in a more peaceful manner the discourse which has been somewhat rudely interrupted isaacar however supplied water in a ewer and linen bandages and the old man forgetting the object of manuel's predatory visit to his abode hastened himself to wash and bind up the wounded arm thou art a good jew and have something of the feeling of the christian in thee said the marquis when the operation was completed didst thou ever suppose that different creeds made different hearts my lord asked the old man in a half melancholy half reproachful tone isaacar i shall not forget this kindness on your part said the marquis blushing with shame at himself when he reflected on the purpose for which he had sought the jew's dwelling heaven knows it is not in my power to reward you with gold but whenever i may henceforth hear your race traduce reckon upon me as its champion the old man cast a look of gratitude upon the marquis and after some little hesitation he said in a tremulous tone your lordship hinted ere now at least methought i understood as much that you required gold i take father abraham above to witness that i am not so rich as ye christians deem me to be but since your lordship can say a kind word of the jew i i will lend you such sum as you may need without interest without bond orsini in whose breast all generous feeling had not been entirely crushed by the vices which had proved his ruin extended his left hand for his right now hung in a sling to the kind-hearted jew exclaiming there is a signor to whom i am indebted worthy isaacar it is for him to say whether he will press me immediately for the sum that i have fairly lost to him with the dice not i ejaculated stefano in his blunt coarse manner and therefore your lordship need not lay yourself under any obligation to the jew who after all is a worthy signor in his way yes exclaimed the marquis i shall ever lie under an obligation to him nor shall i be ashamed to proclaim the fact in the presence of all florence and now my lord resumed stefano i will give you that explanation relative to the diamonds which you might have had without bloodshed but patience and aristocracy are as much at variance as a thief and the headsman read this paper my lord it is not the worst testimonial which i could produce in proof of good character and he handed to the marquis the document which he had compelled the countess of aristino to sign manuel read it with astonishment then she has the diamonds in her possession he exclaimed and you must have seen her since i was there my lord replied stefano as he received back the paper i was at the aristino palace ere now at the same time and in the same room as yourself but this is a mystery i will explain presently as for the diamonds isaacar here can tell your lordship what he has done with the real stones for those that i received from him which i handed to her ladyship were false orsini glanced toward the jew who was now pale and trembling it was to make inquiries on this point continued stefano that i came here on the present occasion and to speak truly it was also with the intention of making the old israelite disgorge his plunder plunder repeated the jew in a tone almost of indignation in spite of the terror with which the bandit captain had inspired him did i not lend my good golden ducats upon those diamonds and must i be blamed if knowing ah knowing too well the base artifices of which many of even the best-born florentine nobles and great ladies are capable must i be blamed i say if aware of all this i adopted a device which the wickedness of others and not our own has rendered common amongst those of our race who traffic in loans upon jewels and precious stones 
Isaacar speaks naught save the pure truth, remarked Orsini, blushing at the justice which dictated these reproaches against the aristocracy whereof he was a member. Signor Verina, he continued, you are a brave man, and I believe you to be a generous one. Confirm this opinion on my part by refraining from further molestation toward the Jew, and thou wilt doubly render me thy debtor. Be that as you will, my lord, grumbled the bandit chief. And now let us depart, for I have much to communicate to your lordship. I am ready to accompany you, returned the Marquis, putting on his plumed hat and settling his cloak with his left hand. One word, my lord, said Isaacar, in his habitual nervous and trembling tone. Should the Countess of Aristino really need her diamonds, really need them, my lord, I should not object, that is, my lord, he added in a firmer voice, as if ashamed at the hesitation with which he was expressing his readiness to do a good action. I will at once give them up to her, trusting her ladyship's honour to pay me my monies at her most benefiting convenience. Her ladyship does not require them now, exclaimed the bandit chief emphatically. The Marquis looked at Stefano inquiringly. There was something ominously mysterious in his words. The brigand stalked in a dogged manner toward the door, as if anxious to hurry the departure so long protracted, and Manuel, having renewed the expressions of his gratitude toward Isaacar ben Solomon, hastily followed Verena from the house. End of section 27 Section 28 of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 27. Stefano and the Marquis, the Stronghold of the Banditti. The moment Stefano and the Marquis were alone together in the open street, the former related all the incidents which had occurred at the Aristino Palace after the departure of Manuel himself, and the young nobleman now learned with feelings of remorse and sorrow that the unfortunate countess had been hurried away to the convent of the carmelites that species of inquisition the gates of which so seldom opened more than once for each new female victim but you promised to save her signor he exclaimed with enthusiastic warmth i gave this pledge in the manner described to your lordship returned verena and i shall not swerve from it think you that her liberation can be effected demanded manuel remember that the convent is protected by the highest personages in the state that violence never will succeed in accomplishing the object for should an armed man dare to pass that sacred threshold every spiro in florence would fly to the spot it is then your lordship who is afraid of attempting the rescue of the countess interrupted stefano in a contemptuous tone that observation is hardly fair signor verina said the young nobleman considering that my right arm is disabled and that the wound was received in combat with yourself i crave your lordship's pardon exclaimed the bandit captain my remark was most uncourteous particularly to one who has ere now given no equivocal proof of his valour but i pretend not to courtly manners and such as i am you will find me faithfully devoted to your service and that of the lady guilia the attempt to rescue her will be somewhat hazardous it is however tolerably sure of success but it can only be undertaken on certain conditions and these regard your lordship's self indeed had i not so opportunely met you at the jew's house i should have sent one of my fellows to you to-morrow in what way do the conditions that you speak of regard myself inquired the marquis to this extent returned the robber chief that you accompany me to my stronghold wherever it may be that you join us in any project or plan that may be undertaken with a view to liberate the countess of aristino and that you remain with us until such project or plan be attempted then whether it succeed or fail you shall be at liberty to take your departure agreed exclaimed manuel and now permit me to ask you one question on what ground do you manifest this interest in behalf of the countess and myself you are well aware that from me you have little to hope in the shape of reward and that the countess will be in no better condition than myself to recompense you even if you succeed in effecting her rescue i am well aware of this my lord answered stefano and i will give you an explanation of my motives as frankly as you solicit it in the first place it suits my projects to make friends as much as possible with nobles and great ladies as no one can say how or when such interest may be available to me or to those connected with me secondly 
i am not sorry to have an excuse for paying a visit to the carmelite convent and in case of failure it will be as well to have a florentine noble amongst us because the statutes of our glorious republic are somewhat unequal in their application thus for instance if a plebeian commit sacrilege he is punished with death but a petition is merely reprimanded by the judge and mulcted in a sum which is devoted to religious purposes in this latter case too the companions of the petition are punished only as he himself is now therefore your lordship's presence amongst us will be a guarantee for our safety lastly for i have another and less selfish motive i admire the spirit with which your lordship spends money drinks a flagon of good wine and loses your thousands at dice for saving your lordship's presence there is much in all those facts which find sympathy with my own inclinations thus everything considered stefano verina and fifty as gallant fellows as ever bore the name of banditti are completely at your lordship's service and that of the dear lady who has the good taste to prefer a dashing roistering blade like yourself to a gentleman no doubt very worthy of esteem but certainly old enough to be her father the marquis made no reply to this tirade but he reflected profoundly upon all that the robber chieftain said as they walked leisurely along through the suburb of alla croce and toward the city he reflected because he now saw all the dangers that were associated with the step he was taking the chance of being arrested with the whole band of lawless freebooters and the dishonour that would attach itself to his name were such an event to occur but on the other hand guilia was immured in consequence of her love for him and his naturally chivalrous disposition triumphed over selfish considerations could her liberation be effected he would fly with her into another state and the revenues arising from her own little patrimony which had been settled on herself at her marriage would enable them to live comfortably if not affluently and who could tell but that her husband might die into state and then all his wealth would become hers by law thus did he reason with himself well my lord you do not reply exclaimed the robber captain impatient of the long silence which had followed his explanations are you content to abide by the conditions i ere now proposed perfectly content answered the marquis he knew that it was useless to reason with the brigand against the spoliation of the convent which he had more than hinted at for it was not likely that the robbers would incur so great a risk as that involved in the sacrilegious invasion of the sacred establishment unless it were with the hope of reaping an adequate reward the bandit chief and the young nobleman had now reached the boundary of the city but instead of entering the streets they turned abruptly to the right stefano acting as guide and plunged into a thick grove of evergreens here my lord said stefano stopping short you must consent to be blindfolded and wherefore demanded manuel indignantly think you that i shall betray the secrets of your dwelling wherever and whatever it may be i entertain no such base suspicion returned verina but we banditti are governed by a code of laws which none of us not even i the chief dare violate to the observance of this code we are bound by an oath of so deadly so dreadful a nature that bold and reckless as we are we could not forget that and i should alike break our laws and depart from my oath were i to conduct an initiated stranger to our stronghold otherwise than blindfolded i offer no further opposition signor verina said the marquis fix on the bandage stefano tied his scarf over the nobleman's eyes and then conducted him slowly through the mazes of the grove in this manner they proceeded for nearly a quarter of an hour when they stopped and stefano quitting manuel's hand said in a low tone stand still just where you are for a moment while i give the signal and do not move a single step for it is a dangerous neighbourhood about half a minute elapsed during which it struck manuel that he heard a bell ring far far underground the sound was very faint but still he felt convinced that he did hear it and that it appeared to come from the bowels of the earth but he had not much time for reflection for stefano once more took his hand saying you are now about to descend a flight of steps they proceeded downward together for some distance when the steps ceased and they pursued their way on a flat surface of pavement but the echoes of their footsteps convinced the marquis that he was treading a subterranean cavern or passage presently a huge door sounding as if it were made of iron was closed behind them and stefano exchanged a few words in a whisper with some one who spoke to him at that point then they descended a few more steps 
and at the bottom another door was banged heavily when they had passed its threshold the echoes resounding like pistol shots throughout the place for a few minutes more did they proceed on another level paved floor and then the gurgling rush of a rapid stream met the ears of the marquis be careful in following me said stefano for you are about to cross a narrow bridge my lord and one false step is destruction slowly they passed over the bridge which seemed to be a single plank of about thirty feet in length and excessively narrow he had no doubt both from the caution which he had received and the elasticity of that dangerous pathway on the opposite side the level paved surface was continued and at the expiration of another minute heavy folding doors closed behind them take off the bandage my lord said stefano as he untied the knot which fastened the scarf at the back of the young nobleman's head the marquis of orsini gladly availed himself of this permission and when the bandage fell from his eyes he found himself in a spacious cavern paved with marble hung with rich tapestry and lighted by four chandeliers of massive silver six pillars of crystal supported the roof and rendered the lustre from the chandeliers almost insupportably brilliant by means of reflection in the midst of this subterranean apartment stood a large table covered with flagons empty wine flasks and drinking cups but the revellers had retired to rest and the marquis and stefano were alone in the banqueting hall follow me my lord said the bandit captain and i will conduct you to a place where you will find as dainty a couch as even a nobleman so accustomed to luxury as your lordship need not despise thus speaking stefano opened an iron door at the end of the hall and led the way along a narrow and low corridor lighted by lamps placed in niches at short intervals at the end of this corridor he knocked at another door which was opened in a few moments by a man who had evidently been aroused from his slumber i bring a guest lomellino said verina see that his lordship be well cared for stefano then retraced his way along the corridor and lomellino closed and bolted the iron door but no pen can describe the astonishment of the marquis when he found himself in a spacious room heaped all around with immense riches massive plate splendid chandeliers gorgeous suits of armour and martial weapons encrusted with gold or set with precious stones chalices and dishes of silver bags of money piled in heaps an immense quality of jewellery spread upon shelves and an infinite assortment of the richest wearing apparel all these suddenly bursting upon the young nobleman's view by the light of a lamp suspended to the roof produced an effect at once brilliant and astounding when lomellino addressed him with a request to follow whither he should lead it seemed as if some rude voice were suddenly awakening him from a delicious dream save that the cause of his pleasure and wonder was still present then ashamed at having allowed himself to be so attracted by the spectacle of boundless wealth around him he followed lomellino to an alcove at the further end of the caverned room and the entrance of which was covered by a purple velvet curtain richly fringed with gold within were two beds having a screen between them these couches were of the most comfortable description and such as in those times were not usually seen elsewhere than in the dwellings of the wealthy near each bed stood a toilet table and washstand with ewers of massive silver and towels of fine linen and to the walls hung two large mirrors articles of exclusive luxury at that point the floor was richly carpeted and a perfumed lamp burned in front of the dial of a water clock lomellino respectfully informed the marquis that one division of the alcove was at his service and manuel was too much wearied by the adventures of the evening not to avail himself of the information the brigand seeing that he was wounded but without asking any questions as to the cause proffered his aid to divest the marquis of his upper clothing and at length the young nobleman was comfortably stretched in one of the voluptuous beds sleep had just closed his eyes and had even already entered upon a vision of fairy enchantment doubtless conjured up to his imagination by the gorgeous spectacle of the treasure-room when he was startled by screams which appeared to issue from the very wall of the alcove at the head of his bed he listened and those screams became more and more piercing in their nature although their tone was subdued as if by the existence of a thick intervening partition holy virgin what sounds are those he exclaimed more in pity than in fear for they were unmistakably female shrieks which he had heard perdition seize on those carmelite nuns cried lomellino they seem to have got another victim another victim murmured the marquis falling back in his bed a prey to the most torturing feelings and then his lips framed the sweet and tender name of guilia 
End of section 28